Okay. Um, so exciting day when uh, Dr. Honeyman uh, allowed us to purchase the smart feeder. Uh, it resides at the McNay Research Farm in, in South Central Iowa. And uh, we've, we've only used it for three studies. Good? Oh, well, now we're good. All right. Yep. And there's a picture of the smart feeder. And, and as you can see, um, there's not a lot of grass growing around it. We kind of modified it. So we did a weaning study that we'll talk about here in a second. And uh, we put some beefy gates around it because we didn't want the bulls to move it. We didn't want the cows getting into it. So we modified it a bit. Uh, and we moved the cows around a rotational grazing system, but we didn't move the feeder. The other thing I want you to notice is how big it is. Uh, there are larger creep feeders out there. It is split into four compartments. We all fed the same feed uh, in all four. So the summary is we used 80 Angus cows. Uh, I don't think you could go a lot higher than that just based on the size of the feeder, and we'll tell you why here in a minute. There was probably close to 100 in the group. Uh, we had a few with twins, a few lost calves, a few late calvers, things of that nature, so we went down to 80. We split them by milk EPD, and what we thought was going to be kind of a genetic study turned into more of an animal behavior study, and I'll tell you why. So if you look at those milk EPDs, those are fairly moderate within the Angus breed, not a lot of high milk cows. So this is fescue country, south central Iowa. They run on pretty tough ground. Uh, so they're kind of naturally selected to be moderate milk. We did three treatments. No creep at all, up to two pounds a day, which we called a limit fed. I had several people in the feed industry tell me that if your calves are eating two pounds a day, on average, they're ready to wean. So that's kind of where we landed there. And then what we called ad lib, which is a lie. It's not really ad lib. We limited them to 15 pounds. We actually started at 10. And as you'll see in the data, we upped that. I think we probably could have went to 20 and some calves would have ate it. So we ended up with about 13 calves in each treatment. Uh, that's a bit of a stretch because there's bull calves, heifer calves, and steer calves within those groups. So we're not gonna see a lot of stat analysis here because when we boil it down, uh, our N wasn't really that high. A typical creep feeding period, 75 days, August, October, spring calving cows. Uh, we did do a whey suckle whey uh, in the middle of the trial. And if you ever get the opportunity to do way suckle way, find an excuse to be busy. So uh, we'll show you when that happened. And probably the most interesting thing that came out of it in the initial study was in the high milk group, only 73% of the calves that could go in the feeder actually went. And in the low milk group, less than half of them ever ate any creep feed even though they could have had access. Some of them limit, some of them ad lib. So probably our biggest struggle is we didn't really believe what was coming out of the data. So we pre repeated the study in the fall calves. So that's a, that's a way different environment. Those calves are in a dry lot with the cow, uh, being fed hay, uh, round bales, typical Midwestern system. So the feeder is much closer to the cow-calf pair than it would be in a grazing setting. Uh, and that high milk, low milk differentiation didn't hold true. Uh, it was there, but not nearly as pronounced as it was in the spring group. Um, Erica Lundy Woolfolk followed the male calves through the feedlot uh, where we tracked individual intake and we'll share just a little bit of that. So here's the treatment averages and uh, there's a lot of busyness in some of these slides I'm gonna on a show, but um, the, treat the treatment averages, you can see there's a ton of variability day to day. Um, and how much intake versus weather and things of that nature, but we'll show you this. This period was when we pulled the cows in for the way suckle way. They had no access to the feeder. And a little more interesting is these are paddock moves. So when we offered the cows fresh grass in a new paddock, the calves didn't go back to the feeder in some cases for two days. Uh, so there was a lot of variability on when they ate. Uh, probably from a visual standpoint, the most interesting thing was you could look at these calves and not really tell which treatment group they were in. I thought, well, we've got calves eating 15 pounds a day. Surely they'll be the shiny fat one that's always camped out at the feeder. And, and you can't really find them like you think you can. So there's a lot going on here. We couldn't show you all 80 calves. So here is the high milk group with both the ad lib and the limit showed. So there should be a couple things that pop. There's an orange one. 
that ate a ton of feed. And we're going to talk about him here in a bit. Uh, but he visited often. He ate a lot when he went there. And then down across the bottom, you can see the limit fed calves. Pretty much every single calf, when they visited the feeder, ate all two pounds. There was only one calf that kind of nibbled and left. Uh, so a lot of variability uh, based on when they ate, how often, and how much they ate when they went in. So an example of kind of the power of the individual intake data from what we discovered here, and this is just two examples, but there's others like this. So 2099 and 2109, uh, both in the same treatment group, okay? Um, as you can see on their EPDs, the cool thing is the growth was actually captured in the EPDs. So there was a growth advantage for the one calf versus the other, and it shows up there, so that's what we would expect. But 2099 had access to the feeder and never went in. 2109 went in a lot. He ate 561 pounds of creep feed in 75 days. The other one ate zero. Both these calves were out of hard-working three-year-olds that were pretty skinny. Uh, condition score on these was like three and a half. Uh, but the one cow gained weight doing it and the other one lost a bit. So these cows are still growing. Um, the, the driving force in this whole talk is if we had no individual creep feet data, which genetic line would you draw to? Probably the one with higher weaning and milk EPDs because there's more growth. Well, if I'm a cow-calf producer, I probably, when corn is six bucks, would prefer 2099 that never went in. So when we look at milk and, and weaning weight genetics, uh, are we to, truly telling the story of what the commercial guy wants uh, or just what we have the ability to measure? So there's, there's a lot of more questions that we need answered um, based on what we found in this first group, and we're gonna keep using this machine to, to tell us more. But So when those two uh, male calves went to the feed yard, the dry matter intake on their receiving trial was about the same. The gain of those two animals held with what we saw on the cow. Uh, so not a lot to go on. We thought maybe, uh, and this is not true across every calf, uh, dry intake on the, the creep feed did help explain intake in the feed yard, uh, but not on every individual animal. And if uh, you look at just the, the basic math, you only gained 12 pounds of weaning weight on the calf on the right, uh, but it cost you about 85 bucks to do it. So what's next? Uh, one of the things we need to figure out with this machine is the video game effect. And that's a Russ Yukon term for those of you that know Russ. Some of those calves just like to go in there and play with this thing and turn it on. And so are they really eating what's there or are they just making the uh, machine turn on, give them feed, or are they changing their consumption based on what the machine does? Would they really eat that much in a typical creep feeder? And we don't really know, but that showed up twice in both the spring and the fall born. Uh, our biggest question is what's happening when we're not there. Uh, Logan Wallace is here. He uh, kind of managed this feeder in both trials. And he called me once and said, uh, there's one calf that's in the no creep trial, but he waits for a calf that's ad lib to go in there and get feed. And then he just beats the tar out of them until they leave. And then he goes and eats their feed. So not, not a lot of research we can pull off on, on something like that. But uh, so we've got to figure that component out. What impact would it have on milk? Um, so if, if we submitted this data as if we didn't know anything about creep feed intake, uh, what would the milk EPD be versus if we submit it like what we know on how much feed they consumed and how different would they be? Uh, and I'm sure there would be some impact there and we're gonna uh, work with Angus on, on seeing what that effect would be. Uh, thank you to the Illinois Beef Association. They funded the first trial, uh, kind of got our blood boiling on, on what we could do with this and, and the Iowa Beef Center funded the, the fall calves. I'm so glad that uh, Gene Rouse is here. So this set of cows is the remnants of what we called the Q line. Uh, they are selected for intermuscular fat for 25 years. Um, so they are carcass cattle in a fescue environment and some of them struggle. Um, so this picture is a 12% IMF image. For those of you that don't know what 12% IMF is, in grade A beef, that's average prime. This is an eight-year-old cow that weaned off a heavy calf 
that also graded really well. We probably shouldn't be selling her for 40 cents a pound. So lots more questions on what we can do uh, with, with that information. Thanks, McCrew. I don't do this by myself. Uh, Erica, Beth, they're here. They, uh, basically, everybody that you've heard from this week from the Beef Center uh, helped cooperate on this. So. I'm happy to share with everyone these, uh, our experience with these behavior monitoring tags, um, what they've done for us, and uh, basically the, the overall practicality uh, for the industry and uh, diversified producers. And for those of you that don't know which one, or not one in specific, but the one that we chose, the one that we used was the AllFlex Sense Hub. And basically it's just a, a dangling ear tag like you saw on this first slide, the blue one in the cow's right ear. Um, records and uh, reports movement and basically the activities it picks up and puts into a nice graph. You see here an example, a screenshot on my phone, um, rumination, eating activity, and uh, eventually uh, after it gets a baseline put together or learns about the animal, it takes about seven weeks from the time you uh, apply the tag and assign it to the animal. Um, then it gives you an activity trend and through the, the cloud, it's a cloud-based software. Uh, you can do it through your phone and computer. And um, once, it, once it gets familiar with the animal and this trends, um, when activity changes and significantly, significantly just like when you observe uh, monitoring heat, um, it notifies you with a text message or a distress alert that the animal's in heat. And the, the in heat alert report gives you a suggested breeding window displayed in hours, countdown to when to breed. Uh, just an overview about our operation, just to kind of show um, how a little bit diversified we are. Uh, for our area, probably a moderate size cow-calf operation and um, do spring and fall breeding, but uh, we have ang mostly Angus cows and we, with a commercial herd also. So pretty much all the Angus, registered Angus cows get synchronized either for AI breeding or embryo transfer. And then we also develop about 100 replacement heifers every year. And annual production sales in February, right during our calving season. That was great planning on my part. And uh, the feedlot, we, we feed out everything we raise and don't keep for production. Also, I buy some customer calves. And uh, those ship out May 1st. Usually, it's right on top when we're transferring embryos. And uh, our fall yearlings will run on irrigated grass and then um, have those finished about mid-February. And also what my grandpa always said, it fueled his, uh, his cattle habits was uh, feedlot fencing. My grandparents started in the 1960s uh, buying used uh, um, oil field materials and selling them for uh, just right during the feedlot boom, just when everybody's expanding in the 60s. And so there's a uh, constant in and out customers in that within the pipe yard and custom gates and stuff making. But uh, we, ha we, have about, we have two employees, one full time for feedlot fencing and one um, as our herdsman. Also my Swiss army wife, we call her because she jumps in, she's over here too, Heather. She jumps in and helps out anywhere and everywhere. And this is just a uh, aerial map just showing how, how spread out we are. It's all within a mile, but just spread out from when we're calving um, there in the green square, turn out during the day, feed at night, hopefully calve during the day, and then uh, pair them out down the road for the pair pens in groups of about 40 try to keep a smaller groups like that. And then they have turnout pastures and they'll stay there until we synchronize and breed and across three locations. And so what, basically what we're using the, using the monitoring, monitoring for is mostly heat, heat detection, obviously, but uh, it allowed us with all those 40 uh, pair pen groups, when I was first at home after college, it was just, you breed, a pen per week. So you get spread out and you be selected about the cattle you breed, but this allows the program and the monitoring allows you to simultaneously synchronize several groups. And we've gotten up to about uh, 120 across, yeah, three pens. And just at the same time, pulling seeders and just full trust in the system, as long as the internet holds up, I'm um, just letting it tell you when to go and where to go. And uh, another thing I found valuable was a postpartum and estrus, just uh, you can watch that from the time they calve, how many times they've cycled or if they've even cycled and uh, make your 
decisions on your synchronization protocols based off that. Cause ultimately I was hoping to eliminate the cedar and do natural heats or, or just a one shot protocol more. And uh, replace with heifer onset of puberty. Once we give a uh, Bruce Lowe's or bangs vaccination to our heifers in the fall, they get a, one of these tags and they're out on corn stalks and I can see who's, who's cycled once before we try to synchronize them. And most, last several years, we've had enough down corn that they've actually done a lot better on corn stalks without feed. So pretty much everybody has cycled. Uh, for the heat detection, uh, that's just a picture of my calendar just to show how I stack up all this stuff. Obviously after the MGA, that's pretty, not much labor intensive, but I'm um, just stacking up cedars in, cedars out. Um, the only thing I didn't fit on this counter because it got really messy was uh, processing pairs and uh, pre-breeding shots and then shipping fat cattle and fixing fence because that pretty much falls in any open spot. But overall, we've just a lot less time manually heat detecting and uh, fewer false heat detections. And uh, I do have, uh, it was about two years ago we, after we did our synchronized AI, I stuck uh, the scratch EstroTech patches on them. And uh, the heifers were, is about 120 head. They were in a pretty good size, probably acre, acre and a half lot. But uh, I pulled just looking at the scratch patches and kind of ignored the system and just compared later. And there's about, uh, it's not saying that scratch patches aren't perfect, but it, it was a, uh, they, they have their use and they, they are pretty accurate, but just being a, you still kind of have to watch them with the patches. But if I just went off the patches rubbed off reading, it was about 20, a little over 20% that we pulled reading according to patches that were false heats. And then afterwards, they just, they just felt like they were not in the right cycle. And then uh, afterwards, the system obviously verified that they were not in heat based on their heat index. On the return heats, back when we're, our pasture is about 30 miles away, so we have to haul everything in a small semi and trailer. Um, it, it's pretty uh, labor free, really. Just check the system in the morning before you go load up and haul a couple times a day, and you can plan your day off that instead of uh, you can be loading trucks instead of marching around up and down uh, heat checking. Uh, so, this. Uh, management situation we had in 2019. I don't have to remind anybody what kind of year that was, but uh, we had uh, extreme weather challenges. It seemed like, I know I wrote down, there was probably six days in February where the sun was actually out of the clouds and it was just constant mud deep and everybody's struggling with uh, getting them enough energy and uh, taking care of their calves also. But uh, according to the system, there's about 58 cows that, were, that had not recorded a system heat they had not broke their threshold to, to tell me they're ready to breed or they're even cycling. And um, it happened, just happened to be the three-year-olds, first calf heifers. Um, some of the cows were just lower body condition score and then late calving all the way up to down to 28 days postpartum, 58 days postpartum. And so we sorted those off, adjusted their ration, gave them the high fat lick tubs. I think it was that Purina Accurate Ration. But uh, at that time, Dr. Briner at Cross Country was working with uh, Mizzou on the seven and seven protocol, which was a whole new thing to grasp in itself, given Ludal ice the same time as cedar was a little hard to get around. But uh, so based on that, this is one, my one graph of data that I can feel like a scholar here today. Um, the heat response, the black is the, the seven and seven protocol. So it is the thinner cows and the, all the ones that were the, the ones that had not cycled, they were struggling. I was probably was worried I was not gonna get those bred. So it was a 56 head that were the seven day cedar, the older cows that are reliable that had cycled before synchronization. But the heat response was greater on the seven seven protocol and the transfer rate was higher. And obviously the, I didn't, I really didn't expect the, the embryo transfer conception to be higher, but that was, I was pretty satisfied with that considering this was essentially their first cycle off of that. And um, uh, since calving. And then, uh, but the most important one to me at the end was after we transfer embryos to turn the herfer bulls out for uh, two cycles cleanup and the end conception rate is, we got 100% on the ones that we, the transfer population. So the ones that we actually transfer embryos into that bred back. So that was a huge, huge bump that some of those might not have bred otherwise had I not been able to monitor and adjust on the fly. 
Thank you for having me here, guys. Uh, uh, I'm gonna leave this slide up a little bit. This is, I wanna take a few minutes and explain uh, our operation, uh, the diversity of it, and, um, and then we'll get into the virtual fencing. Um, if you look at our logo, uh, you see the big diamond in the middle with bull head on it. That, that kind of represents uh, our main business. Uh, uh, we operate uh, about just under a thousand mother cows on our, on our place. Uh, we like to refer to that cow herd as a, as a parent stock genetic cow herd, but really our widget is the black Angus bull. Uh, this year we're gonna merchandise just over 4,000 Angus bulls uh, throughout uh, the course of the year. And then that cow herd that we manage there it controls the genetics for all the bulls that we, that we market throughout the course of the year. If you look to the right, uh, that, the emblem, it's, it's winter wheat that would represent our cropping acres. Uh, we have about 13,000 acres that we crop and manage. Uh, my uncle Brian, he's, he's in charge of all that. About 80% of those total acres um, are raised for feed so we can feed our bulls throughout the course of the year but we do raise some winter wheat and we do sell some certified seed and do some value added things there as well. Um, on the left side of the logo, there is a pheasant. We're blessed uh, to have wild pheasant, a high population of wild pheasant in our, in our area. And uh, uh, so in 2012, we, we built a hunting lodge. Uh, we can handle about uh, 40 hunters at a time. And so uh, what I like to tell people when our family looks at an acre of land, uh, we, we like to look at it where we can, we can do, if we can do three things on that acre, uh, one would be to farm it properly with respect to soil health, no-till practices, things like that. The second thing, if we could take that same acre and, and graze it somehow. Uh, grazing has become a really, really important part of our operation, okay? And then the third thing on that same acre is, is egg retainment. And that's, that's, what we, that's what we refer to as the pheasant hunting. So a lot of operations can do one or two of those things and do them really good. It's, it's really rare for an operation to have the ability to do all three, but with technology like I'm about to talk about, it really helps us get there. These are uh, the four of us that own the business. Uh, my cousin Nick is here with me. Um, to Nick, the young, he's the youngest one in our partner, uh, in our partnership. Then his dad, Brian, he's the uh, crop guy. And then the old guy there, that's my dad, Greg. And of course me there on the, on the left. Um, some of you might remember my grandfather, Martin. Uh, he was uh, heavily involved with BIF. I think we figured out late 70s and throughout the 80s. This is where we're from. This is South Central South Dakota. Uh, we live in a little town called Ideal, which is just in the northern part of our county. So uh, it's West River, west of the Missouri, and uh, can get dry there, but it's a really good place. Very diverse land area, lots of decent crop ground that would, that would also um, include, you know, some, some glacier rub hike high uh, high quality grazing as well. This is the company that we're using. It's called Vince. You guys can look them up. Um, they've got a website and uh, we've been working with these guys since two, uh, January of 2020. Um, there's three main components um, that they offer. Um, and I'm just, I basically just got slides that will show you kind of what, what how it works and what, what it is. Um, it, it comes with a collar that we actually put on the animal. And then it comes with, uh, you have to buy a, a base station, which is uh, a, like a tower, which I'll show you, a uh, tower that the callers talk to the base station and then they, the base station then goes cellular. And that's how we get it to the cloud or our cell phones or however, wherever you want it. And then they have an online platform that helps manage uh, the cattle and, and where you actually build the virtual fences. This is a kind of a, just a bad picture, but this is what the collar looks like on the animal. The best way for me to explain this is, I'm sure all of you are familiar with uh, uh, the dog collars, right? Where they put the dog collar on and they use them for containment in a yard, right? Okay, so you have to bury a wire and then when the dog gets to that point, he gets kind of gets zapped and gets back in, okay? Very similar technology here, except for it's a virtual fence, right? It's, there's no wire. And then the collar is, is actually talks to the tower, which is, which is you can geo-reference um, each animal. I mean, we know what animal gets what collar, so you'll, you physically can know what animal is where at any given time. This is, we're on version two of the collar. This is what it looks like. I got a couple pictures of it. Um, you'll notice the box, the gray box there in the middle, that's, that's what has the battery in it and also has the two prongs that would, would, would conduct the shock when it approaches the vents line, 
okay? And then on the bottom there, there's a, there's a, like a scuba weight. It's a four pound weight. It just helps keep the collar kind of in place. So this gray box would actually end up kind of about right here on the animal. And um, that's what keeps, keeps it on, okay? There's another picture of it, kind of a, uh, a different, the version one collar that we had was a lot more narrow. And the problem with that one was it would, it would either roll, flip out so that the, the electrodes were outside useless, or um, this collar, you have the ability to adjust it while it's on the animal, okay? And the version one collar, you had to build to size. And we just had a lot of problems with, with it literally, you know, falling off or, or flipping. Um, we have these collars on 240 heifers today. A year ago, we had the version one collar on the same amount of heifers and we lost or, or they got flipped or they malfunctioned 80 head, 80 of them we lost, okay? This year on the same amount of cattle with this collar, uh, we're down to 12 that have malfunctioned. And so it is a whole lot better um, this year than it was last year. And I suspect next year it'll even be that much better, okay? This is just a picture of the base station. Um, there's two different kinds of base station. You can get one that's that, if you have the ability to get electricity where you need it, um, you can just hardwire it into electricity and power it that way. But a lot of times, in most cases, um, there's no electricity where you need your base station. So they're solar powered with a battery pack. And that's what keeps, um, that's what connects the collar to um, the cellular and helps you, you know, helps you talk to the, to the collar itself. The, the uh, base station, they say they could, uh, it's, it's about a five mile, five meter radius. But uh, I know Nick, we've had, some, we've had some collars that hit close to 10 miles away from the base station. So it's a radial frequency from the collar to the base station. And then it's cellular from the base station to where you need it. Okay. This is just a picture of, the, of some rotational grazing. We implemented it in a rotational grazing concept. Um, you can kind of see there that this is, this is uh, somewhat of a rectangular field uh, and the water was where that little white flag is there. And what we did was we, we, we dissected this field into three sections from north to south, okay? And um, you see the, per, uh, the pink line there? That would be the vents. That's the vents. So when the animal approaches that, that vents, it, there's an audio that goes off, like a beeping sound. Okay, and then if it, that's what helps create the relationship of getting shocked and, and so on and so forth. So when that animal approaches the vents line, you'll hear a, a bunch of beeping and, 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 then, and then when it gets to the actual vents is when the shock occurs. When you train these animals, you have to train them before you um, can really send them out. It, it takes a little bit of time to get that done. You actually create the vents line next to a real fence. So when these animals run down the fence line and they hit the real fence, they can associate a real fence then with the vents. And they get used to the beeping, they make a relationship with the beeping, and then, and then the shock, okay? And so when we did this on the rotational grazing, you can see where the cattle, um, the, it's, it's a kind of a heat map of where all the cattle were. And, there was, there was no fence there. That's a virtual fence on that field. And then when we moved them, you just, you opened one side of the vents and created a new vents and they just literally moved themselves to the center paddock, okay? And then the same on the, on the end there, you, you, you got rid of the, um, the north vents line and created another vents and then that's, that's how you get, moved them. We didn't have to go out there and push those cattle. Um, they did it on their own. Um, Nick and the vents team actually did it from his desk believe it or not. This is where it really comes into practical use for us. Uh, this is kind of a crazy um, geo, geo map here, but you see the vents line, it goes crooked and up and to the north. Um, this is a ch chunk of property that's over by our hunting lodge. Um, this is property that we have not grazed ever, okay? We have, you can see in there where there's a lot of different food plots and, and, and dams and uh, tree lines. Uh, we were never able to graze this because we didn't want the cattle to eat our food plots. We needed to have a place to hunt. Well, there's about seven or 800 acres of grazing land there that we didn't hunt, we didn't do anything with. We just 
we just kind of looked at it, right? And now with this technology, we're able to actually graze it. So the next slide here, uh, Nick and the Vents team actually went in then and created virtual fences around all of our hunting strips. You can see, um, <laughs> you can see the, the each little line and in, in how they you know they're kind of crooked. So the idea was to keep them out of the tree lines and keep them out of the hunting strips so that the hunting strips would continue to grow and then we're able to use the hunting strips in the fall of the year, but yet graze the grass when it was uh, in its prime stage there. Okay, so this is where it really, um, it really works for us. It's not about really keeping them in, but it's probably more about keeping the cattle away from something that you don't want them to graze. This is a little bit of a close up, but you can see here on the heat map where the cattle actually are, you can see where it's actually working. You can see that they're intensifying right next to the strips. For the most part, they are not in the strip at all. And so Nick, when he, when he saw this video, uh, this map, he, he got excited and, and uh, it just proves that it, it actually is working for us, okay? The cost of the collar, um, Vents is, a, is, is they, they market this product in, in kind of a different way, what you would think. They actually rent the collars. It's, it's like $30 to rent the collar, but you have to buy the base stations. That's what's expensive. The base station, if you have to get one that's, that uh, is solar powered, they're about 11,000 bucks, okay? We've got one that, that we have powered or um, hardwired in. I think they're around 3,000. They're, so they're significantly less. But most of most everybody who's going to use this is probably going to need a solar powered one because of where you have to put it. All right. So when you when you allocate it all out at the end of the day, it it ends ends up being about fifty dollars per collar, not fifty dollars per animal, fifty dollars per collar. And we're fortunate enough with our bulls and the crop ground, uh, we actually are using these collars twice a year. So I don't know about anyone else, but I would guess that if if you actually looked at what it costs to uh, keep your fences up or build new fences throughout the course of the year, my guess is it's, it's around $45 to $50 an animal that each operation is going to do. So really, when you look at this, it's not a lot different than what you would spend on normal fencing throughout the course of the year, in our opinion. Okay, that's, that's all I got. So I've got a couple here. I'll start with uh, Patrick. Uh, Patrick, how do I calculate supplemental feed to gain based off of what you've learned in this process? <laughs> Good question. And I think you know the answer is it's pretty impossible because um, you don't know how much forage they're eating. Uh, you don't know the behavior of the, the animal. You don't really know how much the cow is milking. So that gets really difficult. Um, you know, we could, we could calculate how much creek feed they ate and how much they gained, but you don't know what to attribute to the cow versus the actual feed. So that, that's a struggle. Justin, we got a question here. Okay. Risa, I'm curious on the all flex tag there. So how many stations do you have set up? The, you know, the, the practical part of the operation of those tags, I don't think you described, I, I guess I missed that. Oh but yeah. To, to keep, you know, to get the signal. How, how many places do you have to set up to get that signal and how far away can, can yeah. it be? Sure, the, they say that the range is about a third of a mile, but we're pretty flat, open, uninterrupted. And we can get about half, three quarters of a mile of uh, reading. So I have about, we have two stations I keep plugged in the whole time. And uh, mostly the second station is just in case of, uh, like the very first year we did this with the, started with a collar type system is a bigger uh, antenna and it got lightning strike and it wiped that one out. So basically just have one for backup, but they can read a, if I put it in a, center point perfectly in the middle of our operation where I had power on a good open spot, it would, it would read the full stretch there. Cody, how do you get the escapees back into the group um, if they uh, do breach the barrier? Sure. So they, they do, they will go outside the vents and if the animal is moving away from the vents, they will, it will continue to beep and it will only shock them for just a short period of time. But if they are actually turned around and moving back towards the, the vents, it, it does nothing. So think of it as kind of a check valve. It's, it's okay to go in, but it's not okay to go outside the vents. 
So um, in some cases, they will herd themselves back because the majority of the cattle are inside the vents anyhow, right? So they will eventually, and the water is there as well. So they will eventually go back in inside the vents. Uh, my question's for Cody. Uh, on, the, on the renting the collars, I think you said uh, $30 for renting. Is that for a year? Yes. That's for a year. So you could use them as much as you wanted to yep. within that year. Yep. And don't quote me on that price exactly because I'm not a salesman for them, but um, that's, okay. Okay. That's, that's, kind of, that's kind of the ballpark. Okay. Thank you. I have another question about the electric fence kind of to follow up with the escapees per se. Do you ever have any cattle that just don't respond to that or kind of it may buzz them and they don't really care? Yeah. So we, we put it on a bunch of two-year-old bulls and everyone knows what kind of a pain they are. They're stronger, they're, they're bigger. Um, of course, this was the version one collar as well, but um, we had a, a lot more problems with them. Um, literally, they would just, they, they would actually wear a, a few of them, not all of them, but they would actually wear the battery out and sit there and take the shock, right? <laughs> Maybe it's because they're dumb, I don't know, but it's, it's that is a little bit of a problem. I think what we're gonna where we're gonna land is um, the younger we get the the, the collar on the, uh, on that animal, the earlier we train it, the better luck we're gonna have as they become older. This question is for Cody as well. Um, have you you've used it on bulls and on replacement heifers? But have you used it on cow calf pairs? And if so, have you had to put the collar on the calf as well? Right. So we do have it on a few of our donor cows right now, and um, we do not have to put it on the, on the calf. Um, of course, the calves follow the, follow the cow, right? And in some cases, when you think about a rotational grazing situation where you want the cows to kind of clean up, clean up the grass a, you know, a little better, well, the, sometimes the young calves then are on the better grass, and we thought that that was okay. So... Um, we're not sure where that's going to lead. Uh, we don't. We haven't done it on a lot of pairs per se. Uh, right now, a lot of a lot of the data that we are collecting is on bread, uh, the bread heifer, yearling heifers. So, Cody, I apologize for bombarding you with questions, mm -hmm. um, but how often are you rotating those heifers? And then, additionally, how long were those collars batteries lasting? Yeah. So the, the, the batteries are supposed to last, I think it's six, six months or a grazing season is what they're designed to, to last. And again, that's where the technology probably needs some work, just like we talked about earlier. Um, you know, getting, getting them to last longer. I think the biggest problem we have is certain animals just breach the vents more, therefore it wears the battery out quicker, right? And so when that happens, then, then you gotta go in and reset and it's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, but I, I think the, the platform is really, really good. It's really exciting. Um, I think that the, the concept is there. I think once we get the collar a little better, I think, I think it's going to be awesome. It's going to be game changing. We'll say that. Question for you, Patrick. In uh, your initial study, if I recall correctly, on the low milk group, half the calves never even went to the creep feeder. Is that correct? Yeah, there's le less than half. Is there a behavior or any other hypothesis you have? Because, I mean, conventional logic would say if they're not getting enough milk, they're probably going to supplement with feed. So I'll answer that two part because that's what we thought. That The reason I posted that, that particular piece of information was that was what kind of shoved us to do it again. Um, because we, we first thought, well, is, it, is the high milk calf eating more creep feed and that's why he has more performance genetics that's what we we're trying to get at well when we changed the environment and we did it again in the falls we didn't see that uh, the other thing is the way suckle way actually showed us that the low milk epd cows offered more liquid milk not much but a little more so that we all know that that are in this crowd that, you know, milk EPD is a pretty poor predictor of the actual white stuff that comes out of the udder. So we didn't really, it didn't really alarm us much, uh, but it didn't really help us either. So uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but we, we like you have, have more questions to, to look at based on what we saw in that first initial group. I've got a question, uh, question. Reese, as, as somebody who thinks about software quite a bit, 
a common question we get is here's the feature that needs to be added here's the feature so what aspect of that technology that you use would you say is the next ad that that would help you make decisions based off the data you got well i'd say it's actually a good question because i had a piece that i forgot to highlight um how much their heat activity or the heat index is correlated to like the levels of estradiol in their blood so we i kind of tried to organize it a uh, study about this, but it's, it seems like a lot, too many moving parts are drawn blood every so often. But uh, just uh, from what some stuff that I did was just keep track of the cows that are completely bald on the tail head. Those were the ones, there's very few that came back for the return heats. So it's just something like that that would actually pair up and um, not necessarily through the software, but like just a feature that makes sense to tie those two together. All right, everybody, thanks for the great presentations. I was just wondering, what are the biggest challenges to each of these technologies and how can they be overcome? Patrick, we'll start with you. Okay, uh, so I talked about a few of them, but the, the animal behavior side is, is the challenge. So you can't babysit the feeder all the time. Um, so you have to either trust the information you're getting back, which I should, I should go back. Uh, every one of us that's involved with the project gets an email at midnight that tells you how much each individual consumed. And for the first week, I thought the thing wasn't working because like we just said, only half the calves are even going in there. What's wrong with this piece of equipment? It's not working. Well, is that an animal behavior change that's happening because of the way the feeder is designed? Because they have to stick their head clear in that thing and then a motor turns on and spits feed out. That can scare some of them. And in the training population, the training weeks that we did, some of the calves visited, but then never went back. So did they get scared? We don't know. Um, and then conversely on the other side is, do some of them just enjoy the fact that that machine spits them feed and I'm gonna eat it whether I'm hungry or not? That's the big challenge in a weaning study. Uh, the second part of that is the one we're doing right now is a mineral study on the same set of cows. So we thought, well, let's see if this thing carries through to the dams and we split them on milk again and then offered every single cow on the farm ad lib access to mineral. Well, in the spring when the grass is washy and we used a high mag mineral with kind of a low salt content, we had cows eating three pounds of mineral in a 24 hour period. And they did it subsequent days for three days in a row. How many of you would look at that on your phone and go, yeah, that cow ate nine pounds of mineral in three days and think it was legit. But that's what the system tells you is how really variable individual intake can be. And you either have to trust it. Uh, we even talked about putting uh, game cameras up on, on the ends of that feeder to, to try to catch an ear tag to see if, you know, that, that little fat turd was actually eating 15 pounds in a day. Um, but you would have to position the camera to catch his tag as he went in, and, and that just wasn't feasible. So that's the biggest challenge is just trusting what the system tells you as, as it's legit or not. Yeah, the challenge is real simple, inter reliable internet access, and it's going to be fixed by Elon Musk. But, <laughs> but really, I thought it was kind of a silly topic to talk about internet accessibility and reliability for like rural areas, but now I truly see with technologies like this and everything we've been talking about, it's a real stranglehold on the industry and it's just an efficiency that it's just not letting uh, grow and uh, help people out. And that's the whole reason our, we are such a great industry is because of our efficiencies, so. Yeah, and for us, I guess uh, it's, it's the same thing. It's the animal behavior with respect to the collar. Um, uh, Nick has, has done, Nick and Vince uh, has done, they've done a lot of work, just R&D work, just to try to get this collar better. Um, we're on version two and I know they're working on version three. I don't know what that looks like yet, but uh, I, I just think um, over time, uh, you know, our family is committed to this concept. Um, it actually benefits us directly with, with land that I just explained about that we were unable to graze and now we can. Um, as I come across I-80, I look at all the terraces and all the ungrazed acres uh, I, I think it, it truly, once we, once we get this technology right, I, I truly believe that it is a game changer for, for grazing animals. No more creek washouts. Yeah. Hey. 
Uh, Reese, you had mentioned, obviously you guys are using these ear tags to look at increased activity uh, for heat detection and things like that, but are you also getting notifications and looking at, you know, drastic drops in, uh, you know, inactivity to look at for things like lameness and illness and things like that, trying to think about, you know, like feedlot, you know, monitoring activity. If your walking decreases that much, you probably have an issue going on. So just kind of your thoughts on that. Yeah, it is um, helpful in that way. It does, uh, there's like the, the premium subscription, I guess, for the tags. It covers uh, health and heat, so it can monitor like their activity. And that health alert it gives you will, will show you like, hey, this cow has not moved very much. And there has been several times I went and just looked to see what's going on. It was uh, because her calf was laying flat with scours or just sick in the creep pen and she just wouldn't leave a side. And then, um, just the and the feedlot haven't really haven't attached anything in the feedlot, but uh, there there is another system out there that's uh, just specifically for feedlot animals. So Reese, can you share? And maybe I missed it, but rough costs on the system that you all are using currently? Yeah, it's um, yeah, I didn't mention it. Uh, it's uh, seventy, I think it's seventy two dollars per tag for the premium. That's health and heat, and that. The battery life they set estimated was to be three years long, and we just had three and a half years use out of them. And if you just want the heat detection, I believe it's uh, about $50. Is that right, Tracy? And then um, the, obviously the controller antenna is about 2,500, and then extra antenna is another thousand. But the way we cut that cost in half is we put them in pre breeding shots in our spring herd, breed, cut them out at frag check, the ones we need to stick the ones we need in the fall herd. And we can just reassign the tag numbers in the software. So right there, it splits the cost in half and get quite a bit of use out of them. Uh, Cody, two questions. On the uh, the collars, how do they work on two-year-old bulls with the different little necks where there's a, a higher loss of collars on them? Uh, and, and then also, is there any, do you come across any problems of the collars maybe get a little loose or something on the heifers rubbing sore spots or anything like that? Right. So it is a challenge to put them on those big bulls. Um, we've had uh, really pretty terrible luck with that. I mean, the clip on the collar right now, as it's designed today is, is just a hard plastic clip and it's got, I think a four or 600 pound breakaway. Well, a big bull like that can just pretty much just pull that clip through. And so that's something that they're working on for sure. Um, uh, I, I think, again, once we get the collar figured out, I really think that this is really exciting technology. And right now, that is that is the challenge, is the collar, um, the actual clip. Um, the version one collar, we actually had to, had to measure and build those collars to size. And we had a lot of them that just fell off or flipped, um, especially if we had to trailer those cattle anywhere. They would rub in the trailer and, and flip around. Um, version two, you can actually cinch it up and get it a little tighter and kind of more to fit the size. And, and the, response to, you know, the response to that was so much better for us. And so we're already closer, closer with just version two. Yep. And I know they're working on version three, which I, I, I know is gonna be better too. We're getting closer. Question here. Do you know who owns the data that you collect and are you in control of who gets it and who gets to use it? I, yeah, uh, I hope we own it, but um, I, I can't honestly sit here and tell you that. That might be a question for Nick. We own it. We own the data. I'm pretty positive it doesn't go to the Chinese on our side. But yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's pretty open. And it's just uh, like you can click and download each graph and data and uh, they're pretty transparent, but I believe it might go back to SCR, the, the company that started with the dairy collars that has a lot of information because it just goes back to building their algorithm. So it's in their own interest to hang on to that themselves. Last question. Question for Pat. So um, when you split the cows based on milk EPD, how different were the cows for the other traits? So let me make sure I understand that. So how different were they for the other traits, meaning like carcass traits and that? So the only two we looked at, the only two traits we looked at were weaning weight and milk. And we split them on milk and then made sure that the contemporary groups were very similar on weaning weight. Outside of that, we didn't, we didn't look at any other columns. Um, could have, but for the, for the design of the study, we were after performance. Uh, so those were the two columns we looked at. We did, 
uh, I should mention, we ultrasounded all the calves uh, at the onset of the trial and at the end, as well as the cows to kind of track uh, fat thickness deposition, body condition score, um, even marbling deposition changes, and really didn't see anything pop as far as changes through that 70 day period that were unexpected. The calves that ate a lot of feed got fatter. Okay, whoop de doo. Uh, the cows that gained weight got fatter. Okay, we understand that. Um, the, the big thing was just on, on the initial and at the end, how some of those cows held marbling basically 365 days a year. Um, so that, that was the surprise from the study. But to answer your question, no, we only looked at two columns. 